What a great time of worship this morning. Beautiful, simply beautiful. Key, thank you. We give God all the honor and all the praise for that. I am back from a mission field in Alabama. That's, that was my first time to Alabama. I always wondered. I, I, I realized something this week. Because I grew up in far southeastern Oklahoma. So I didn't really know if I, would I be categorized as a redneck or a cowboy. I didn't know. I, sometimes it kind of went back and forth. Now I know because I've been to Alabama. I'm a cowboy. I've seen a redneck and I'm not that. I, I, you know, I always heard about them, but I, I never saw one before. I always thought it was like Bigfoot, that maybe they really didn't exist. Now, is anybody from Alabama in here today? No, I'll tell you <laughs> No, I had a great week there, a great week. Uh, uh, some of you already know, but one of our young men who uh, was a part of our church, who went on uh, to pastor his own church, and so he uh, is in his first pastorate right now, uh, Clay Mosley, and he invited me to come and preach at uh, the first revival that he, his that he's been able to do as a pastor. So I spent a week with him. Great church, and he's doing a great work there. And so uh, just so very proud of him. If you would be in prayer, I have a men's event that I'm preaching tonight, and so uh, over in Midwest City. So I would appreciate your prayers for that. I also have a couple of other. Uh, revivals coming up that I'll be preaching, and then also a trip overseas. Um, so if you could pray a lot, I would appreciate that. Let's open our Bibles this morning to the book of Amos, the Old Testament book of Amos. You'll be happy to know that we will conclude Amos this morning, Lord willing, and I will be starting a new sermon series starting next Sunday on the Farewell Discourse. Uh, it's a series entitled Abide in Me, but we are going to be looking at John chapter 13 all the way through John chapter 17 and looking at Jesus saying farewell to his disciples and what he expected out of them in his, while he was gone. And so we're going to be looking at that and it's going to be a great series. So go ahead and start. Thirteen through seventeen. And uh, you'll be ready for that series. But today, Amos. Amos chapter 8. Let's look there at verse 4. Amos says to Israel, hear this. You who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, when will the new moon be over that we may sell again and the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale? That we may make an ephah small and the shekel great and deal deceitfully with false balances. That we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account and everyone mourn who dwells in it? And all of it rise like the Nile and be tossed about and sink again like the Nile of Egypt. And on that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feast into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like the morning for only a son and the end of it like a bitter day. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but a hearing of the word of the Lord. God says, I'm going to send a famine. I'm not going to speak to you anymore. That's the famine. And as a result of God not speaking to them, look at verse 13, or 12. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. And they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord. 
but they shall not find it. And that day a lovely lovely virgins and the young men shall faint for thirst. Those who swear by the guilt of Samaria and say, As your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Beersheba lives, they shall fall and never rise again. Father, we pray for your blessing upon the preaching of your word. Lord, help us to receive it as the word of God and not as a word of man. Lord, conform our hearts to your will. And I pray that we would listen with humility. And I pray that we would submit. And that, Lord, we would turn from all evil and pursue righteousness. We pray for those here today who are not saved. We pray for their salvation. We pray for revival for your church. Spiritual awakening for this land. And we ask you all these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, This week I preached in Alabama, uh, and I primarily preached through the book of Jonah. Now, one of the interesting things about the book of Jonah is that Jonah actually believes that he can run from the presence of God. When you look at Jonah chapter 1, God gives Jonah a command. He says, I want you to arise and go to the great city of Nineveh, and I want you to to proclaim there against it. And the Bible says that Jonah arose and fled. God says, arise and go. Jonah arose and fled. And the Bible says, he arose to flee from the presence of God. He says that a couple of times in chapter chapter, uh, 1, that Jonah is seeking to flee from the presence of God. Well, we know the rest of the story that Jonah ends up uh, being thrown over the side of a boat and drowning and then being swallowed by a fish. Now, the interesting thing is that as long as Jonah was on the boat, if you read Jonah 1, the more severe the storm came. The Bible says that as Jonah was asleep in the bottom of the boat, God appointed a storm, a great storm. And the Bible says that as long as Jonah was on the boat, the the storm grew in its intensity until the point that uh, Jonah was thrown over the side. Then the Bible says that God appointed a, a fish and Swallowed Jonah, and, and God left him there in the belly of that, whatever it was, a bottom feeder, for however long, before he finally came to his senses and repented before God, and God had the fish to vomit Jonah on dry ground. Now, here's the point. The title of this sermon is, God is Undefeated. Here's Jonah thinking that he could outrun God, thinking that he could run from the presence of God, thinking that somehow he could defeat God, and God revealed to Jonah that there are no contenders when it comes with God. There's no top ten. There's no number one contender. God is God all by himself, and God is undefeated. No one can contend with God. If you think about all the major world empires, that have existed throughout history. You, we, could talk, we could think about uh, you know, Rome and then the Byzantine and the Ottoman Empire. And we could talk about all, the, and even the British Empire. We can talk about all these great empires. And one of the things that we come to realize is that empires rise and fall. One empire is defeated by another empire. But what we learn from the, the Word of God is that God's kingdom is undefeated. God is undefeated when it comes to dealing with individuals, and God is undefeated when it comes to dealing with the empires of this world. God is undefeated when it comes to dealing with the nations of this world, and God is undefeated when it comes to vanquishing the darkness of this world. God himself is undefeated, and there are no contenders as it relates to God. So why do we fight against him?
Why do we fight against him? That's what the nation of Israel, it's exactly what they were doing, fighting against God. So we see this passage and it's almost like God is saying, okay, you want to step into the ring? Let me, op- let me hold the ropes open for you. So God says to the nation of Israel, okay, you want to step in the ring. You want to contend with me. But what you don't realize is I'm going to contend with you. You see, the first thing that we see here is that God contends with Israel's corrupt commerce. He contends with their corrupt commerce. Look there at your Bibles. Picking up in verse 4, he says, Hear this, you who trample the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, When will the new moon be over and when will the Sabbath uh, that we may sell the grain? And the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale. So they're wanting the Sabbath to be over. So that they can sell. So they can sell their grain. So that they can sell their wheat. Now why do they want to do that? Well, look at what he goes on to say. That they, we may offer wheat for sale. That we may make the ephah small and the shekel great. And deal deceitfully with false balances. They said, man, we're waiting. We're ready for the Sabbath to be over. So that we can jack up the prices on the poor. And actually make money off of them. That's what the nation of Israel, that's what they were doing at this time. Oppressing the poor, deceiving the poor, taking advantage of the poor. And God says, I see your commerce. I see how you buy and trade and sell. And I see how you take advantage of the poor. And I'm here to contend with your corrupt commerce how was their commerce corrupt well they profited off the poor and they pursued wealth that's all they cared about was profiting off the poor and building their own bank accounts you think about our world today we see it I mean When you look at inflationary economics, (laughs) which is what? Less is more. Clothing. Look at the clothing that is sold today in many department stores here in America. Clothing we buy. The hymns on some are barely even turned over. Some of the clothes, the hymns are not even stitched or if they are stitched it's a single stitch not a double stitch which means that it's only going to fall apart in a short amount of time it's barely held together yet the price is higher this is happening right now in America cheaper clothing with higher prices cheaper vehicles I'm sorry cheaper made vehicles Sold at higher prices. That don't last. Does God care about this? You bet he does. God cares about how we do commerce. God cares about economics. And if we are putting out a product that's not worth the dime that's spent on it, And the only people that prosper from that are the wealthy who make it. And the poor are are the ones being taken advantage of. They can't afford to go to the top brand, the name, whatever. So they do the best they can. They go to places and, and because of where they are financially, they purchase these things. And they're made so cheaply. And they fall apart. And But yet, it just keeps happening. God sees it. He'll take care of it. 
these leaders of these companies and these major organizations that know that their products are cheap made, but they sell them at a high price, will stand before a holy God and be held accountable for how they have oppressed the poor. And I would encourage you, if you have a business, that you make sure that all your practices are in line with God's will. And make sure you're not practicing anything that would result in oppression of the poor. We're not to profit from the poor. Our life is not to be spent in the pursuit of wealth. You ought to do something one day. I know we, you know, if you ever get a little extra money, sometimes we, you know, we get a little extra money. Somebody, I had a guy walk up to me a couple weeks ago, and he said, at a revival, and he just, he gave me a white envelope, and he said, this is for you, Pastor, and I, and I, which I took it and put it in my pocket, looked at it later, and there was $200 in there. I'm like, oh, well, that's great. Lord, you've blessed me, and I'm going to be a blessing to somebody else. So I, I took $200 in 20s and put them in my pocket. And you know what I did for the next two days? Passed out $20 to people in the name of Jesus. People in need. Not just anybody. I would discern. God, who do you want me to give this to? Who needs it? How about the, the guy at the hotel who's a young man who's probably got a wife and small children at home, and he's over there wiping tables at the Holiday Inn Express, wiping tables down. Do you think he might need that? You think an extra 20 might, might help him? Or the lady cleaning your room? You think a, an extra 20 might be a blessing? What, what if we did that? What if we just said, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do that. I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to go buy something else I don't need. I'm just going to give it away. Because there are people out there who need it a lot more. A lot, they need it more than I do. And just see people smile. To see them smile. To say thank you. You know what I like to walk up to people? I say this. I say, do you know what? This is what I tell them. Because they don't know me. So I'm just walking up on them. I walk up on them and I say, you know what? You know what I've discovered in life? And they're like, no. That you never know when, when the Lord, Jesus, is going to bless you. And then I bless them. I say it that way so they'll know it's coming from Christ, not me. There's joy in that. There's blessing in that. We look here, and what was the nation of Israel doing? They were cheating the poor. They were abandoning the poor. Why? Because they hated the poor. And why did they hate the poor? Why did they cheat the poor? Why did they abandon the poor? Are you ready for it? To simply increase their own wealth. Can I tell you that this nation is in trouble? Because of our wicked commerce. And the rich get well, richer and the poor get poorer. And God knows it. And God sees it. And God will do something about it. Do you know the Lord said that you'll always have the poor among you? What is your attitude towards the poor? Is it judgment? Ridicule? It ought to be love. And compassion. Care. We move on from here and 
the Lord says the reason that they, look at what they do. They deal deceitfully. We see that in verse 5. They, they make false balances. And now look at what God says in verse 7. The Lord has sworn. Now this is where you need to really pay attention. He says, the Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob. And that's really the root cause, right? Pride. He says, the Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob. Surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account and everyone mourn who dwells in it? Why? Because of their corrupt commerce. God says, listen, you need to tremble and you need to mourn. Why? Because the nation's commerce is corrupt. And how so? Oppressing the poor to make themselves wealthier. And then he says in verse 9, on that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. These are pronouncements of judgment. He says, I will turn your feast into mourning and your songs into lamentation. The joy will be removed. I will bring sackcloth on every ways and baldness on every, every head. That is the, the just chastisement of God. He says, I will make it like the morning for only a son, and the end of it will be like a bitter day. You know what that's a proclamation of? Perishing. God is saying what you don't realize is that you're actually perishing in your prosperity. You didn't get that. I want to say it again so all those word of faith, health, wealth, and prosperity preachers can get it. Right? Here you go. It is possible to be perishing in your prosperity. If your prosperity is gained corruptly. And when you get on TV like one, some of you will know this person, when you get on TV like someone did years ago who's dead now and say, unless we raise a million dollars to buy me a new airplane, God said he's going to kill me. Right? God said he's going to kill me. If we don't raise a million dollars to buy me a new air airplane. I can't believe God didn't kill him right then. That, that is grace and mercy. That's corruption. And so, so here they are. They're prospering at the expense of the poor. And they don't realize that their prosperity is actually their perish. Their perishing. So not only does God contend with their corrupt commerce, secondly, God contends with their callous conscience. With their callous conscience. He says in verse 11, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord, and they shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. And they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord. But they shall not find it. Why? Because their conscience has become calloused. This is a poor illustration, but I'm going to use it anyway. But back when, back when I used to work out all the time and I was doing CrossFit, you don't wear gloves when you do CrossFit. You use bare hands. Okay? You might put chalk on there. But you don't wear gloves. That way you get better grip on the bar. Well, when you first start CrossFit, guess how many tears and rips you think you get on your hand? A bunch. When you start out from all the pull-ups you do and all the bars that you hang on to, for the first couple of months, your hands will just be blistered and, and, and skin will be torn. But then eventually, what happens? Calluses begin to build up. And over time, your calluses get, those, get so thick, you never tear. That is what has happened to the nation of Israel. 
They have resisted and rebelled against God's call for so long that their hearts are no longer tender. Their hearts are now hard. Their hearts are now calloused over. And God says, the famine that I'm going to send to you is not the famine of water or bread, but it's going to be the famine of the Word. And you're going to seek for the Word, and you're not going to be able to find it. Why? For several reasons. One reason is this. is because they've been rejecting God's revelation up to this point. God has been revealing to them over and over and over again their sin, their oppression of the poor. God has been revealing their corrupt practices. God has sent them prophet. He has sent them Amos. He has sent them Joel. He has sent them Isaiah. Hosea, God has sent these prophets. And what have they done? They've ignored the prophets. You heard last week where Amaziah even tried to get Amos to be quiet. God says, You've, your, your conscience is so callous that you have rejected my revelation. You are forsaking faithfulness, is what God's telling them. And as a result, you're wandering in the spiritual wilderness. I hope that by now that, I don't know if you know this or not, but every sermon I preach builds, okay? Each thing builds off the other. It's progressive. I'm taking you somewhere. So when you look at this sermon, what do we realize? We realize that here we have a nation that is involved in corrupt practices. And the reason they are involved in corrupt practices is because their conscience has become callous. And their conscience has become callous because they have rejected God's revelation. And they have forsaken faithfulness. And now... Because of a callous conscience and because of corrupt commerce, they are wandering spiritually in a wilderness. Look at what he says. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. In that day, even the lovely virgins and the young men shall fall faint for thirst. Even those who are pure won't be able to find the word. Those who swear by the guilt of Samaria and say, as your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Beersheba lives, they shall fall and never rise again. They're wandering spiritually, just wandering aimlessly in corruption, perishing in their prosperity, and they don't even realize it because their conscience has become callous. Because of years and years and years of rejection. And years and years and years of forsaking faithfulness. Which brings us to the third thing that God contends with. God contends with their cruel condemnation. They have condemned the poor. So the Lord is going to contend with this cruel condemnation. Look at verse, chapter 9, verse 1. I saw the Lord standing beside the altar. Standing? Yeah, it's a picture of sovereignty. It's a picture of the sovereign Lord. He's standing. He's standing, why? Because he's pronouncing judgment. He's standing as sovereign Lord, pronouncing judgment. Why is he standing? Because he's calling to repentance. Why is he standing? Because he's ready to receive all who will come to him in repentance. He's standing, a sovereign Lord, judge of all the cosmos, calling those who are sinful to repent, eager to receive them. But notice the pronouncement of judgment against Israel because of their calloused corruption. And cruel intentions. He says, strike the capitals until the thresholds straight, uh, shake and shatter them on the heads of the people. And those who are left of them, I will kill with the sword. God says, You're, you want to be cruel? 
You want to cruelly condemn the poor? Then I'm going to cruelly condemn you. Not one of them shall flee away. Not one of them shall escape. If they dig into Sheol, from there shall my hand take them. If they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. If they hide themselves on the top of Carmel, from there I will search them out and take them. If they hide from my side at the bottom of the sea, there I will command the serpent and it shall bite them. If they go into captivity before their enemies, there I will command the sword and it shall kill them. I will fix my eyes upon them for evil and not good. The Lord of hosts, he who touches the earth and melts it and all who dwell in it mourn and all of it rises like the Nile and it stinks again like the Nile of Egypt who builds his upper chambers in the heavens and founds its vaults upon the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out upon the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. Are you not like the Cushites to me, O people of Israel, declares the Lord? Did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Capsor and the Syrians from Kith or Kerr? Behold, the eyes of the Lord are upon the sinful kingdom. That's how God describes Israel. As a sinful kingdom. Because of their oppression of the poor. He says, I will destroy it from the surface of the ground. Except that I will utterly not destroy the house of Jacob, declares the Lord. The Lord always saves a remnant. For behold, I will command and shake the house of Israel among the nations. As the one shakes with a, uh, uh, with a sieve. But no, pe no pebble shall fall to the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword. Disaster shall not overtake or meet us. That's what they say. Look at what they say. Disaster's not coming. It's not going to meet us. Don't listen to those prophets who pronounce judgment. Don't listen to those preachers who call people to repent. No, no, no. We want those guys who say, peace, peace. We want those preachers that will tell us everything's okay. Peace, peace. Peace, peace. When there is no peace. Peace, peace when a nation is under the judgment of God. Should we expect peace? Should we expect peace? In the, mind of our, in the, in the light of our moral depravity? Should we expect peace as a nation in light of our oppression of the poor? Should we expect peace as a nation in light of our corrupt commerce? I, I'm, I'm going to share a story with you, then we're going to close this thing. We're, we're going to close. I'm going to give you some application. Do you remember Miriam, Moses' sister? Miriam. In Numbers chapter 12, Miriam and Aaron, those are Moses' two siblings. They start criticizing Moses' leadership. And not only do they criticize Moses' leadership, they criticize Moses' Ethiopian wife. You know what God does? He strikes her with leprosy. And for seven days, 
Miriam lived as a leper. Outside of society. Utterly humiliated. If there's one thing I know about God, is that He cares for the poor and the ostracized and the persecuted and the oppressed. And we have a responsibility as a church to proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to all mankind. But to go the extra mile. And not just to proclaim the gospel, which is first and foremost, because we care about the soul. But there are also physical and emotional needs that need to be met. And we have a responsibility. No, we have a commission given to us by God. And modeled in Christ. What it looks like to love our neighbor as ourselves. And what does it look like? Go read this, the story of the Good Samaritan. Go, go read M- Matthew when he said, when Jesus said, when you clothed me, when you fed me. When you visited me. And he said, Lord, when did we do that? And what did he say? What you have done to the least of these. You have done unto me. So I leave you with these three things. As far as application. The only way we're going to be able to live the life that God wants us to live. Is that we live We stay in this book. Wasn't that their problem? They rejected the revelation, and as a result, they forsook faithfulness. And God says, you're going to reject my word? Then I'm going to cause a famine of the word. And after the book of Malachi and before the book of Matthew, God did not speak through a prophet for 400 years. I don't know know about you, but I, I don't want there to be a famine in the land and only that I don't want my heart to become calloused and I don't want to be involved in corrupt practices I don't want to feel the cruel condemnation of God because I've condemned others so what do I need to do as a man of God I need to number one (laughs) I need to read my Bible with reverence Until I receive illumination. That's key. Read your Bible with reverence until you receive illumination. That's the key. Because I have no doubt that there are some people in here who read their Bible every day. Or every other day. But make sure you're reading it with reverence in order to receive illumination and not just check off a box. You keep reading it until you receive illumination from God concerning something specific in your life or something that He wants you to do or something that reveals His character to you. So number one, read with reverence the Word Until you receive illumination. Second, meditate on it until your sight is clear and your soul is fed. This is is the problem. I think people read their Bibles. So what's the issue? If people are reading their Bibles, then what's up with the moral decline? I'm just going to assume that everybody's reading their Bibles. I'm just going to assume that. 
And so if everybody's reading their Bibles, then, then what's the issue? It's the issue is that we're just reading our Bibles. We're not reading our Bibles out of reverence in order to receive illumination. And we're not, we're not meditating on the Bible in order to gain clear sight and to feed our soul. So you meditate upon it until God gives you clear direction and you read it and meditate upon it until you feel your soul fed. And then thirdly, obey immediately all that it reveals. Obey immediately all that it reveals. So read it with reverence until you receive illumination. Meditate on it until you receive clear sight and your soul is fed. And then thirdly, obey immediately all that is revealed. If you don't, you're going to be found trying to contend with God. And he's undefeated. Just ask Jonah. He's undefeated. Don't contend with God. Submit to God. Humble yourself before God. And God will use your life as a light in the midst of darkness. Go ahead, Keith. Others in here? Be sure of your salvation. As we conclude the book of Amos, he's going to promise restoration. As a matter of fact, if you look at verses, uh, if you look at uh, verse 11 and following, he promises to restore them. He says, in that day I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen. And I will repair its breaches. I will raise up its ruins. I will rebuild it as the days of old. In that, my, uh, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. And all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. When the ply- plowman shall overtake the reaper. And the treader of graves, him who sows the seed. This is all positive. The Lord says, listen, I've been pronouncing judgment. But in the end, I pronounce restoration. The mountains shall drip with wine. And the hills shall overflow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel. And they shall rebuild the ruined cities. And they shall inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards. And they shall drink wine. And they shall make gardens. And eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land and they shall never again be uprooted out of that land I've given them says the Lord your God oh how God restores the repentant those who come to him in humble repentance he restores he builds up he heals ask Miriam In her pride, she was struck with leprosy. In her humility, she was restored. How will you respond this morning? In pride or in humility? If you need Christ, you come. Others, you say, you know, I know I'm saved, but... I just want to, between you and the Lord, I just want to renew my commitment to Him today. I just want to humble myself before Him. And I, and I just want to say, Lord, help me to be more focused on others than I am myself. Help me to see with your eyes and to feel with your heart and to work with your hands for your glory. You know what, Lord? Just take my life and let it be. Let it be used for Thee. Take my life and make it Your own. 
it shall be your holy throne. Take it, Lord. Take all my life, all my moments and all my days, and let them flow in ceaseless praise. Lord, take it all. Take it all. Take every sin. Take every anxiety. Take every poor decision that I've made financially. Take it, God. Take my marriage, Lord. Take my children. Take it all, Lord. Take it. I trust you with it. I trust you with everything. Why? Because we have a shepherd greater than Amos. And his name is Jesus. And he'll never leave us nor forsake us. I want to ask you if you would to stand and come now as the Lord leads you come. Hey, we want to say thank you for checking us out on YouTube. Thank you for listening to the sermon. And if you have any questions about the content of that sermon or even about salvation, uh, please contact us on the website that's listed there on the screen. We would love to hear from you, also be able to speak with you, and perhaps even answer any questions that you may have. God bless. Keep tuning in.